Hello, everyone, and welcome to Blogging Theology. Today, I am delighted to talk to Dr. Mehmet Bolgen. Uh, you are most welcome, sir. Uh, thank you, uh, Paul. Thank you for inviting me. It's a great pre pleasure to be here. Uh, Mehmet is a professor of theology at Mamara University in Istanbul in Turkey. He is the author of a recent paper entitled Science and Philosophy in the Classical Period of Kalam. It's actually a slightly longer title, but I'll let Mehmed explain that to you. Today, uh, Mehmed will discuss uh, Islamic theology, Kalam, and the rise of science in the Muslim world with reference to his paper. And at the end of his presentation, He'll be showing us an absolutely fascinating video. It's about four minutes long from the BBC. I've seen snippets of it, and you will not believe it. I'm not going to give away what it is, but it's an amazing piece of science that was anticipated by uh, Muslim scientists many centuries before Galileo. And uh, it's from the BBC. And I'm not going to say any more because I don't want to give away the uh, the subject. But it's I, I was astonished when I saw it, as I'm I'm sure you will be too. But anyway, uh, Mehmed, would you like to introduce us to the subject? Uh, thank you again, Paul, uh, for inviting me. So as I told you, uh, my uh, presentation is going to be about my recent article, which is science and philosophy in classical period of Kalam. Inshallah, uh, I am going to uh, introduce the topic by uh, concerning uh, two important terms, uh, which are Dakhik and Latif subjects, which uh, uh, refer to scientific and philosophical topics in classical Peran. Uh, let me share uh, my uh, screen uh, uh, at first. Please do. Uh, Okay. Okay. Yep. So uh, my article uh, came out at Kader Journal in uh, Turkey, uh, uh, and uh, usually Kalam uh, articles uh, 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 have been published at that journal. So uh, let me uh, clarify at first what does Kalam mean. Yep. So. Uh, because it is related to Kalam's uh, scientific uh, relations mm. in classical period. And uh, many of you uh, uh, have heard a lot of uh, things about Kalam probably. And uh, Kalam literally means speech, uh, word or talk in Arabic language. But uh, this term is commonly used to present the moment in medieval Islamic theology. Uh, that attempted to clarify and defend core doctrines of Islam in, uh, in a rational way. So, but uh, I like the definition of Kalam as myself, uh, as a fundamental Islamic science that uh, uh, demonstrate and uh, determines and uh, defends Islamic creeds. And of course, this aspect of Kalam usually refers to uh, uh, revelation, chronic revelation, but on the other hand, uh, Mutekellumun had deep interest uh, regarding philosophy, science, and other uh, intellectual. Okay, but, but uh, back right. is, uh, there, is there a, a slide, slide number two, that you can show us? Okay, and uh, here uh, I, I would also say that uh, Mutekellumun. Uh, Scholars of Kalam are called mutekellumun in Arabic, and we are going to say mutekellumun, inshallah. And one important thing uh, we should say that uh, the science of Kalam also includes mainstream theological sects uh, in Islam, such as Ash'ariya and Matridiya. And uh, of course, many of you uh, heard uh, Imam Ghazali, uh, Fahret Narrazi, uh, Ash'ari. Mm. Uh, Imam Maturidi, all of them uh, belong to science of Kalam. That's why Kalam had tremendous effect in uh, Islamic uh, uh, civilization in terms of uh, religion, Islamic religion. Okay. So, will you, will you be um, showing us the, the slide for number two for what is Kalam? Relationship with science and philosophy right now. Are you, do you see it? No. 
you need to click on it. Uh, yeah, if you just go down and just click on the sidebar where it says, what is Kalam, number two. Uh, I already... That's the one. Yeah. Okay. We, we, we're now on uh, what is Kalam. So you've explained it means uh, speech, word, talk. Um, but the Kalam. No, I explained them. Yep. Exactly. So I'm just uh, uh, the science of Kalam, as you say, not only covers what we would call um, theology, creed, akida, but also, um, surprisingly for some, for me, includes science even or mathematics. Uh, and you mentioned some of the. Uh, leading thinkers um, in the Kalam theology there. Yeah. This one is... Uh, and number three. Slide. Yeah. Number three. Yep, number three. Good stuff. Okay, can I share it? Uh, you, you've already, you're already sharing it. It's up. Uh, slide number three is, is up. Okay. So... Uh, and uh, there is a discussion on current scholar scholarship regarding uh, Kalam's relationship with science and philosophy. Hmm. Since uh, Kalam includes theological aspects, as I told you, uh, Mutekellimun uh, attempted to uh, determine, demonstrate, and uh, defend Islamic uh, core of Islamic creeds. So therefore, uh, Mutekellimun uh, interest in uh, Kalam uh, philosophical and scientific issues are uh, usually regarded apologetic, apologetical consideration, not truth seeker. And uh, therefore, Mutekellimun uh, cannot, uh, could not be regarded as a, a scientist or a philosophers like Islamic philosophers and other. Uh, uh, scholars uh, who dealt with science and philosophy in Islamic civilization. But on, on the other hand, uh, scholars uh, uh, have been uh, discussing the role and place of scientific issues uh, among themselves. For instance, some scholars like Montgomery Mott, for instance, Sayyid Hussein Nasser, uh, they are trying to describe Kellum's interest with science and philosophy a little bit limited fashion. They said that only a small, small amounts of Mutekellumun were dealing with scientific issues. Uh, and therefore, Mutekellumun's interest uh, uh, in uh, philosophy and uh, science were limited according to them. But on the other hand, a uh, majority of researchers, uh, uh, especially recent uh, uh, works uh, such as say, uh, such as uh, Joseph Fanes, uh, Al Nur Zanani, Muhammad Basrat Tahi, also, and uh, uh, Abdul Hamid Sabra, they are describing uh, Mutekellimus interest with science and philosophy very profound manner. And no. uh, just take a look what did uh, Abdul Hamid Sabra, who was a historian of. Uh, uh, science at Harvard University. He was also a student of Karl Popper. Uh, yeah. In his uh, article, he said that it is not possible to describe, let alone explain, the outgrowth of uh, philosophy and science in the Islamic world without considering their interaction with Kalam. So yeah. uh, uh, he has a very nice article I offer our uh, audiences to take a look at his uh, works as well. Also, uh, Anur Zanani, we uh, should mention his uh, very uh, esteemed works. He wrote uh, The Physical Theory of Kalam. I also uh, translated uh, his book into Turkish. So uh, he was giving a lot of information regarding uh, Kalam, Tekelimus, interest, physics, physical and philosophical issues as well. So, so are, you, are, you, are you saying that some of these scholars, uh, regrettably, did not perhaps give... Uh, the, the right credit to uh, Kalam theologians' uh, 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 real interest in science just for the sake of knowledge, just for the sake of truth in about the universe, in the cosmology, in the physics and the mathematics, uh, that, that not enough credit was given to these Kalam theologians for their research 
and their signs in its own right. So it wasn't just like a, you know, a, a minor thing. It, was, it wasn't that important. And what really matters was just theology. No, you're saying, and most researchers, I think you are saying, are saying no, that there was a serious engagement really early on exactly. by the Kalam theologians in real science, in the empirical method, in physics, cosmology, and so on and so on. So, And this is really important, isn't it, what you're saying, because it, it shows it. You know, Kalam was not just interested in revelation, Akida, you know, the uh, the creed. It was also really interested in in science centuries before the European Renaissance, which we'll come to perhaps later. Have I? Is that yeah, centuries just just before Renaissance, but before uh, Islamic philosophy, like Kinni, yeah, came yeah. out in Islamic civilization. For instance, many mutakellimun were earlier than Kindi, but they were dealing with scientific and philosophical issues. Because Al Kindi is, is, is called the, the first great philosopher of Islam. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I was just saying Al Kindi is seen as by, by many as the first great philosopher in Islam, and and you're saying no, no, this predates that. Exactly. In, uh, in uh, so we're going back here, perhaps to the eighth century um, when the when these Kalam theologians were doing their science, perhaps? Is that yeah. the right date? Or? At the midst of 8th century. Uh, Mid-8th yeah. century. Yeah. Which is really yeah. early. Yeah. Really early. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. Okay, yeah. thank you. Well, that's really, really interesting um, about Kalam. As you say, Kalam's relationship with science and philosophy is much richer and much more uh, including theology, philosophy, and real science really early on in the history of Islamic thought. So that's a really interesting exactly. insight. Exactly. The problem is that since Mutekellemun were dealing with theological issues such as Tawhid principle, yeah. and they were dealing with the different Islamic creeds, right, and therefore uh, they uh, <coughs> would uh, have been uh, regarded. Usually, they were just theologians. Right. They were dealing with these issues for the sake of apologetical uh, reasons to right. defend right. Islamic creeds, not for the sake of truth seeker. Like scientists, right. I am trying to uh, 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 falsify uh, this uh, uh, this uh, uh, idea here in my presentation. Yes, yes, and of course in my article. I, I, just uh, uh, on a more human level, I'm just recognizing in the bottom of the screen here some of the people from my memory. Is that is that um, Montgomery Watts on the far left, the the Scottish? Exactly. Uh, yeah, and then the next one is Said Nasser who, of course, is very much still with us. Uh, Montgomery Watt sadly passed away. Uh, Professor Said Nasser is an, a former Iranian or is Iranian-American uh, citizen. And the guy in the middle, I think, is Professor Joseph Van S., the German. Yeah, exactly. He's and of course, he, he passed away two years uh, ago. Just literally a, a very prominent um, German uh, scholar of uh, Islamic history in Kalam. I don't know who the other guy is, the, the guy, the next one. Who's he? This one is Abdul Hamid Sabra. He, he ah. was the uh, student of Karl Popper. Karl oh, Popper, no less. Gosh. Yeah, uh, exactly. Karl Popper was a very he famous British professor blogger. at Harvard University, historian of science. Yeah. And he had a very nice article regarding uh, Kalam. And you just quoted him, uh, of course. The last you? sentence uh, yeah. refers to his yeah. uh, famous uh, saying. Uh, exactly. he, he said that it's not possible to describe. Let alone explain the outgrowth of philosophy and science in the Islamic world without considering their interaction with Kalam. Wow. It's a very strong uh, stance. It, it is. And the, and the next guy uh, along who is Anur he? Dhanani. He, he, he was the uh, writer of uh, the physical theory of Kalam, which is great. And uh, also he is the student of Abdul Hamid Sabra. By the way, he prepared uh -huh. his... Uh, uh, PhD dissertation under the supervisor of Abdul Hamid Sabra. Right. And his book, The Physical Theory of Kalam, depends on his uh, uh, PhD dissertation uh, he presented at Harvard University. Ah, okay. These are serious uh, works regarding. And the last uh, professor is my first friend, uh, uh, Professor uh, Mohammed Basil at Tai. He's a physicist, a cosmologist, and he had very valuable books, including Dakikul Kalam right. and articles on that subject. Fascinating. And uh, first two uh, scholars, they describe Kalam's interest with science and philosophy, 
as a limited manner, and but on others, for scholars, they are describing Kalam's interest with uh, science and philosophy very uh, uh, profound manner. Interesting, very interesting. And th these are the big names, the biggest names. Like, so, what, what's the beginning is a very, very famous, probably one of the most famous Orientalist Western scholars of the 20th century. And Syed Nasser is a polymath. I mean, he's an expert in so many fields, still very much with us. And uh, Anyway, go on. Uh, S himself is a very, very prominent German scholar. But these are all the big. These are the big names, folks. So if you want to yeah. get, get acquainted with the field, these are the people to uh, uh, living and deceased. Uh, these are the names to get to know and the works to read. I think. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. So on to number four. The next slide. Here, number four. I think. Yes. I think you need to click on it. Perfect. Oh, my goodness. This is number four. Yep, yeah, we got it. That's good. Okay. Do you see the screen? The beginning of scientific and philosophical discussion exactly. in Kalam. Yeah, it's all looking good to me. Yeah. So uh, in my article, of course, I considered uh, what these uh, scholars uh, 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 to, uh, to tell regarding Kalam's interest with science and philosophy. And uh, depending on my uh, words, I uh, try to describe by considering uh, Mutekellamu's own work, and uh, especially I focused on early periods and I try to uh, uh, define what, what is the real interest uh, of Mutekellamu with science and philosophy. So, and then uh, when we look at very, very early period and especially at the beginning of Kalam, at the uh, beginning of 8th century, we see that Mutekellemun were dealing with uh, usually theological uh, issues, such as, for instance, uh, imam and leadership of the Islamic community, also status of person who committed grave sin. We call this uh, Murtakib al-Kabira, also uh, free will and predestination. They were discussing uh, also uh, Qaza and Qader, they were discussing usually theological uh, topics. And, but when we look at Makalat books, such as uh, Imam Matrevi's, uh, sorry, Imam Eshari's Makalatul Islamiyin, and uh, uh, Abu Qasim al Belhis Kitab al Makalat, also uh, Sheikh Mufid's Awail uh, al Makalat, we saw a very uh, interesting situation. Uh, when the time came at the midst of 8th century, Mutekellemun uh, started discussing about the nature of uh, bodies, nature of uh, uh, the universe, the uh, constitutions of the universe, what does knowledge mean, what are meanings of knowledge, also what does substance mean, uh, how motion occurs, and we have a lot of discussions among Mutekellemun. For instance, uh, Imam Eshari in his Makalat al Islamiyin, he reports that at his time, Mutekellemun were divided into 12 groups regarding their understanding of body, jism, nature of bodies. It's and amazing. 12 groups are an amazing number. So the, the, these, the, 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 the very fact that there were 12 suggests that there was a very lively debate amongst a, a large group of people who had different views um, uh, about how we should understand uh, the body. So th this is a very exactly. clearly uh, an intellectually very lively and creative period in the middle of the 8th century. Uh, yeah. In the midst of 8th century, also uh, not just bodies, for instance, whether bodies uh, are divisible infinitely or not, Imam Meshari uh, told that Mutekellemun <laughs> divided 14 different groups. Wow. Also, in his book, he includes many discussions regarding nature of uh, motion, for instance, how motion occurs, yeah, yeah. for instance. And all these names, tribe in armor, look at their 
death date. Mm, right. Uh, Seven hundred ninety-five. Yeah. yeah. Eight hundred ten. There was no Kindi at that time who was regarded as first Islamic philosopher. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but they were discussing about philosophical issues, mm. scientific issues. The problem is that mütekellimun uh, were not given uh, uh, have not given a proper place regarding uh, uh, Islamic uh, 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 science, history of Islamic science. Uh, although they had a lot of discussion regarding science and philosophy, for instance, not just uh, Makalat book. When we look at uh, Ibn Nadim, who is uh, very famous, he had uh, he has a book which is theorist. He is giving all books written by Mutakellimun, also other scholars in uh, eighth and ninth century of. Uh, Islamic civilization, classical Islamic civilization. For instance, he, he was uh, giving uh, some uh, uh, names. Are we, some to, books, are, we, are we on to the next slide now? Number five, the books that. Are we on to the next slide now? Yeah. Do you see the no, number five? You're, you're, right you're now? Need to click, uh, each time you need to oh, click on again. this five before us to see it. So just click on it. There we okay. go. Oh no. Uh, yeah, we're there. That's good. That's all we need to do. You just. It's up there. So books that uh, Ibn al-Nadim attributed okay. to the early Mutakali Mun. Exactly. Okay. Here. Good. Yeah, that's Let me good. explain here. Good stuff. Uh, thank you, Paul, for <laughs> giving me for your passion. Yeah, <laughs> I'm a little bit excited. <laughs> so, and uh, uh, not only just Makalat book, but also we have another sources to uh, demonstrate how Mutakali Mun uh, we're dealing with science and philosophy. The another important demonstration is Ibn Nadim's uh, book of Fihrist. Ibn Nadim, in his book, uh, he's giving a, a book's name uh, 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 written by Mutekellemun and other scholars at 8th and 9th century. And uh, for instance, I'm just uh, mentioning some of uh, the books right now, uh, you can uh, check the, my article to see a complete uh, list of books uh, as well. For instance, Hisham bin Akem, he wrote a book to criticize Aristotle. Well, is, Aristotle is fit, exactly. uh, at the uh, heat. I find that very interesting, if I may say, because uh, I was under the impression that m m a number of scholars just kind of followed Aristotle and, f f uh, you know, and the ancient yeah. Greek. But here we have very early on, you got uh, Hakam here, who uh, died just a century after the, the prophet himself passed away, upon whom be peace, uh, arguing against Aristotle, uh, who, of course, wasn't... Um, well, he, he was a pagan uh, yeah. philosopher. Another one, uh, the refutation of Aristotle on substances and accidents. So these were not slavishly following Aristotle. They were critiquing Aristotle and writing yeah, to, exactly. to refute him uh, very, very early on. Sorry. Oh, well, yeah. The, these are important uh, information. Why? Because both names lived before Kinney, yeah. who is regarded the first Islamic philosopher. But it means that Mutekellimun were already dealing with philosophy and science before Islamic philosophy came out at Islamic uh, yes. civilization. Yeah. So wow. let's take a look at Abu Huzayl al-Allah. Although he, was, uh, he died uh, 850, but uh, he, uh, he lived uh, almost 100 years. That's why he goes back very, very early ages. But he were writing, he was writing about uh, on substance and accidences, also the question on motion and other accidences also. He uh, has two books regarding motion, how motion occurs. And uh, this is very important. Also take a look, Abu Bakr al Assam. he also died 816, he wrote on Kitab uh, Al Harakat on motion, also and Nazam. Then maybe the most important one is is uh, was uh, a Nazam. 
He was uh, the student of Abu Huzayr al-Allah as well. I just uh, mentioned uh, two books of him, Kitab al-Juz on Adam, Kitab al-Tawallud on causality, for instance. So also Muammer was uh, defending another uh, ideas uh, in Kalam. For mm -hmm. instance, he was on the one hand atomist, but on the other hand, he was uh, accepting natures, for instance. I, I, and, just, uh, I, I just wanted just to sorry to interrupt. I just wanted to clarify. People are not familiar with this word accidents. In English, the word accident means you know if you if you trip over, if you if you make a mistake, if you drop the teacup <laughs> on the floor, uh, that's what that's an oops. That's an accident. Um, that's not what it means here. And I've just got my. Um, uh, uh, the Oxford Dictionary of Philosophy uh, here, a tiny little section, just to read you what we're talking about, because it's a, it's, a, it's a technical term in philosophy. Uh, in, in, and it says here in, in, in Aristotle as well, an accident is a property of a thing which is not part of the essence of a thing. Thank so, you. for example, it's colour, it's shape, it's taste, um, it's size, and so on. If that's not the essence of a thing, it's called an accident of a thing. Exactly. Uh, it's just a technical term in Aristotelian metaphysics. We don't really need to know that today, in today's world, but if you're going to understand Kalam, um, you will need to know that. So, sorry, I just wanted to make that clearer. Yeah, uh, you're right. Uh, accident usually refers to secondary qualities, not essential qualities, but mutekellumun okay. uh, have uh, their own understanding of definitions. Right. For instance, uh, when we uh, say substance in mutekellumun term, it refers to atom, indivisible particle. Ah, right. Okay. Not just uh, substance which uh, subsists by itself, which right. uh, stands by itself. It right. also comes with different name. It can uh, exist. It can continue. It can. Uh, uh, it cannot be divisible. It carries accidents, something like that. Right. Uh, in my book, I uh, uh, count eight different definitions of substance. Really? Even by oh, okay. Just I can see. It means that <laughs> Mutekellemu okay. develop very sophisticated yeah. terms yeah. by right. themselves. Okay, cool. Yeah. Uh, we're going on to the next one. So you need to click on number six then, the next slide, to get that up. Religious Kalam and philosophical Kalam. Okay, do you see the... No, you need to click on it. You see on, the, on my left-hand okay. screen? Okay. That's it. Okay. Yeah, that's all about you. Perfect. You've got it up. Good stuff. Kalam al-Din and Kalam al falsifa Okay. Okay. Good so, stuff. and after uh, I got that Mutekellemun uh, showed great interest regarding philosophy and science, and uh, also uh, Mutekellemun interest comes with great diversity, richness as well, I encountered two terms to describe Mutekellemun's interest regarding do these issues. Yeah. The first term I encountered uh, at Jahus, he was a famous mutekellimin, mutekellim, he was student of Nazam as well. Uh, he had a very interesting book, Kitab al Hayvan, uh, regarding zoology, and it comes with uh, seven volumes. And he, he was he wrote, uh, he wrote a, sorry, describing animals. He wrote a seven volume work on yeah, zoology. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's uh, this is in the uh, he died in two five five or eight six nine A.D. Okay, cool. exactly. So at that book, the, he uh, uh, describes uh, characteristics of mutekellemun, and he said that a mutekellem will not be able to master the complete scope of kalam as long as his proficiency in religion. He is using kalam at the end here is not on the same level as his proficiency in philosophy, Kalam al falsafa And he will not succeed in acquiring the qualities needed for becoming an expert or reaching the level of master in this discipline, he means Kalam here, 
In our view, a scholar is the one who can synthesize both in his person. So he says that if you want to be mutakallim, you have to reconcile kalamuddin and kalamul falsafa. Otherwise, you are not going to be good mutakallim. Interesting. Now, now, just to clarify here, uh, when you talk about proficiency in, <clears throat> in philosophy, kalam al falsafa, we're talking also about science here, aren't we? We're not talking about Plato or Kant or, you know, we're, we're talking about actual zoo we're talking about zoology we're talking about yeah, physics. Exactly. We're talking about yeah. mathematics and cosmology that's what he means by philosophy yeah, yeah. Okay. just after his quote he was mentioning about tabai <laughs> natures for right. Instance. right philosophy at that time refers to natural philosophy exactly Most we have that in english uh, actually the term natural philosophy in english used to be what was meant by science say in the 18th and 19th centuries uh, but now it's called science but it's the same yeah. thing. So here we're talking about proficiency in philosophy, meaning he says to be a good uh, Kalam scholar, you've got to not only know the dean, you've also got to know about science. And you've got to have, exactly. you've got to be proficient, be an expert in both, he's saying. Yeah, I think this uh, quote is uh, very important uh, to show Mutekelamu's interest with Kala philosophy by using a yeah. special term, especially. Very interesting. Very I also interesting. encountered this term when I was uh, reading Ibn Nadim's. Uh, he was mentioning about Nazam. And uh, as I told you, Nazam was the uh, uh, teacher of Al Jahiz. So he states that and Nazam follows the path of philosophical kalam mm -hmm. in his poems. Philosophical kalam, he wow. was saying. So also, he is continuing to say that Abu Nuwa wrote to criticize Nazam's interest and involvement in philosophy. Right. It clearly shows that Mutekellumun uh, were regarded as a kind of philosophers. But on the other hand, they were also interested in theological issues yeah. because Mutazilite uh, was uh, considering Tawhid principle, monotheism. For instance, they are trying to demonstrate, determine Islamic creeds, defend. So that's why, mm. and there are two aspects of Kalam here, Kalam al -din and yeah. Kalam al -falsafa. Exactly. And, and, and they, they should be synthesized to the same master level in, in a scholar. Uh, exactly. So, uh, and the other thing is, I, I've said I've said this at the beginning, and I'll just repeatedly I remind people as we go through. There's an amazing video at the end of this presentation, um, which Mahmed will show us, which shows some of the extraordinary fruit of this Kalam al falsafa anticipating the European Renaissance by many, many centuries, and it's quite remarkable. So, I'm not going to say what what it is, but uh, you will not be disappointed if you watch it at the end. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we need to click on the that's at number seven. Perfect. We're getting the hang of it now. Okay. okay, here. Yeah, yeah, that's good. It's up. I can see it. Perfect. So after I continue uh, my I continued my research, and uh, in tenth uh, century, I encountered different term to describe to uh, 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 ascribe uh, Mutekellemun's interest uh, in philosophy and science. Yeah. So, and uh, on the one hand, Jalil Kalam, which refers to Mutekellemun's interest in religion and revelation. On the other hand, Takik or Latif subjects of Kalam, which refer to uh, Mutekellemun's interest in as, uh, natural sciences. So, and uh, uh, what, uh, what, uh, what Mutekellemun, for instance, I encountered this uh, division and classification. For instance, Abu Hassan al Ashari in his Makalatul Islamiyin, uh, at first, he was uh, giving uh, information regarding theological issues uh, concerning, uh, for instance, prophethood, revelation, 
which uh, caused major uh, separation among Muslims. And then he started saying that right now uh, I am going to give uh, uh, ideas of mutekellimu regarding dakhik issues, subtle issues, fine issues. And at that session, uh, Abu Hassan al ashari are giving, uh, he's, he's uh, giving uh, information regarding mutekellimu interest or, uh, in uh, uh, philosophical and scientific issues concerning uh, cosmology, physics, and also epistemology, ontology. So, and also in his Risale fi Thamaratil Ulum, Abu Ayyan al uh, By the way, he is a critic of Mutekellimun, and he was not Mutekellim, he was a, a mystic and philosopher. And, but on the other hand, uh, he was uh, describing uh, Kalam, and he said that Kalam is divided into a minor part, Dakhik, or subtle part, which is undertaken solely, <clears throat> solely on the basis of reason, and into the part which deal with major questions, which deals with major questions, uh, which depend on revelation, he says. Yeah. I think this is also a clear stance. How Kalam is classified or divided into uh, Jalil topics, which refer to theological issues based on revelation. On the one hand, on another hand, uh, uh, scientific issues, cosmological issues, epistemological issues, based on reason. Yeah, that's clear. So, yeah, that's good. Okay. Yeah, good. And let me give a concrete example and uh, from uh, Abu Hussein Hayyaz Kitab al-Intisar, Kitab al-Intisar. He enumerates major and fine subject of Kalam as follows. Jalil matters, he, uh, uh, it comprises divine oneness, divine justice, prophethood and revelation, according to Hayat. He was a leader of Baghdad Mutazlite school at that time. He died 913, by the way. Also, he uh, classified Dakik matters. He is mentioning these matters. Annihil annihilation and continuation of thing, theory of knowledge, theory of secondary causation, the categorization of objects in the world, the discussion of whole and the part, the finite and infinite, <clears throat> the nature of man and knowledge. And he's uh, putting two different uh, uh, aspects of Kalam, and he's uh, differentiating two aspects of Kalam by mentioning uh, certain issues. Yeah. And we can clearly see that Jalil matters usually depend on revelation, of course. I think it sounds like reveal theology and natural theology mm. in today's aspects, maybe. No, that, that's how we that. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. of course, it comes with uh, some uh, uh, differentiation as well. But maybe we can establish a resemblance with mm. our contemporary world. Yeah. So, this is the ninth one. Okay. Yep, that's cool. Let's mm -hmm. take a look at another important source. And uh, Imam Eshari's Makalatul uh, Islamiyin, Makalatul Islamiyin, Imam Ashari is a very famous uh, mutekellim. He, he was uh, with uh, Bastian Mutazlite before, but he separated from them 
That's and right. he established uh, 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 Ash'ariya, which is a dominant school of Islamic theology. So, and uh, he uh, made a separation in his uh, Makalat al Islamiyin book. And, and in his second chapter, he separate, he called the uh, uh, chapter as Dakikul Kelam. And he was giving Mutekellemu's ideas uh, on these headings, for instance. Uh, the structure of bodies, as I told you, he uh, said that Mutekellemu classified 12 different groups. And many Mutekellemu uh, uh, maintained different opinions regarding nature of bodies, also substance and its meaning. He is giving different meanings as well whether or not all substances are objects, the sameness of substance, indivisible part, can two moments exist in a part. Also, he is giving a very uh, interesting uh, discussion. For instance, can a person extend his hand beyond the universe, which is a <laughs> very uh, interesting topic. Also, knowing colors by means of senses. Mm. Also, uh, whether sound our body sounds our body or not, and uh, also uh, the nature of space, time as well, the mm. five senses, and uh, the the another important thing is that Makalat al uh almost ten different <coughs> topics regarding how motion occur. Mm. How motion occurs, okay, gosh. which is very important. It shows that Mutekellemun showed great interest regarding how motion uh, takes place and causality as well. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, uh, Paul, we can't just say that Mutekellemun were just uh, theologian. They were apologetically uh, uh, dealing with these issues. But these books and these uh, names of topics uh, show uh, great interest. Uh, Absolutely. I, I mean, their, yeah. Uh, uh, interest and engagement, in my view. No, clearly, but many of these have a contemporary feel. But the, the nature of perception and the causes of perception, and that this is a, something of great, of great interest, uh, and the nature of man, space, time. Uh, how we know colors by our senses, causality, uh, and, and so on. Th these are all very uh, 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 scientific. Uh, they're certainly not, yeah, a result exactly. of, they're not, they're not a result of wahi, a revelation necessarily, but they can be independently investigated using reason, observation, the empirical method, um, which, um, uh, I mean, jo Joseph Van Ness, just to read one of the quotes from your, your book, you, you cite Professor S., one of the most important researchers in the early field of uh, Kalam history says the empirical method for studying nature was used by scholars in the Islamic world long before the European Renaissance, many centuries before. And as I said, yeah, yeah. as I said, endlessly at the very end, you'll see um, uh, a video, a very short video from the BBC uh, demonstrating an extraordinary experiment that was anticipated Galileo by many, many centuries. Um, so it's an amazing experiment conducted recently. Um, anyway. So number 10. Okay. okay. Let's take a look at another uh, Makalat book. So, and uh, El Kabi's Kitab El, uh, Kitab El Makalat. Uh, El Kabi, Abu Qasim El Kabi is a contemporary of Imam Ashari, but he was the leader of Bada school of Mutazlite. At that time, Mutazlite uh, uh, had two schools, Bastrian schools and Bada schools, and uh, they were discussing with each other. For instance, Nisaburi, uh, who is a contemporary of Ibn Matteve, who lived in uh, uh, element century, he was uh, giving uh, their uh, discussion in his book of Masail Fil Khilaf Bain al Basriyin wal Baghdadiyin. I also mentioned 
uh, his uh, book in my article and uh, audience can take a look my article and how Bastian Mutazlait and Bağdat Mutazlait were discussing uh, such as whether hala void exists in the universe or not. They were developing a lot of arguments against each other. And uh, Dr. Ahmed uh, uh, Mekin Kandemir uh, had, uh, had a very, has a very nice article. He, his article just came out from Nazariat Journal regarding how Basrian and Baghdad Mutazla scholar were discussing about uh, whether void uh, exists or not in the universe, for instance. Mm, mm, no, so no. let's uh, just take a look uh, headings whether the non-existent madum is a thing which refers to ontological discussions. Interestingly, Mutaz Light, Basra Mutaz Light, uh, said that uh, before existing substance and accident were thing, uh, shay, before uh, they exist, for instance. Very interesting opinion. Mm. So it's worth considering this uh, topic. Also, the nature of body and its states weave on the earth and the universe weaves on the two stones passing the other one through, weave on indivisible part, weaves on the accident of body, weaves on man again, weaves on time, space, weaves on air, natural actions. For instance, the station of someone who looks outside of the universe. No, I, like that. I like that one. That's a, that's, a, that's a good one, that. I like that. <laughs> Can we take a look uh, at the outside of the universe? Yeah, if we could just step outside, outside of it and just, just have a look at the universe. Let's just step outside for a moment and have a look at the universe. Uh, if only with that simple. Yeah, yeah. So, the another one, this is the last Makalat book we are going to mention. And uh, it belongs to Sheikh Mufid. He is a Shi Mutekellim. I, by the way, Kalam uh, was not common in Ahl Sunnah. It was also common among Shis. Right. For instance, Sheikh Muhit was a Shi uh, Mutekellim at that time. Shia, it belongs to Shia sect. Yeah. So uh, he was uh, giving the same uh, information in his uh, part of uh, Latif uh, min, min al kalam as I told you, Latif and Dakik subject refers to uh, topics uh, related to cosmology, physics, natural sciences. So uh, he has some headings, substances, accidents, bodies, are substances homogeneous or different? Do substances have surface and magnitudes, non-existence, place of substance and accidents of locations? Do substances need a place, nature, nature's composition of bodies from nature's void and fullness, hala and mala? Is the earth moving or at rest? Earth and its shape. They were also some mutekellimun, who defend that Earth is moving. It was not resting at that time, for instance. Yeah, yeah. And they were always coming with different ideas. Mm. This is the interesting. And of course, uh, after uh, 10th century, two uh, major Mutazla uh, schools established, as I told you, Baghdad and Basrian Mutazla, but early period, Many mutekellimun were defending different ideas. So it means that they were uh, a scientific uh, inquiry and also uh, interest uh, and also uh, of uh, ideas with uh, a kind of, uh, they were thinking about the universe and they were producing creative ideas and uh, that's why, for instance, Mutekellimun were atomists. On the other hand, no one uh, find that when did Mutekellimun get this atomism? 
it doesn't resemble what ancient Greeks uh, defend. It doesn't resemble what uh, Indians defend in terms of Adamism. Why? Because Mutevkelemon by themselves develop these uh, kind of Adamism by discussing each other's many arguments they establish Basrian, Barat, Mutaz, like. So uh, that's yeah. why Adamism yeah. is the creative endeavor of Mutevkelemon. That's why recent studies uh, consider that don't take a look ancient Greek, don't just take a look Indians, just focus on what was going on at 9th and 8th century in Islamic civilization among Mutekelimun. I, mean, I get the impression that the, these kinds of inquiries... ...of Islamic philosophy. Yeah. No, I get the impression that these kinds of in investigations, these questions about the earth and its shape, where the earth is moving, are quite rare in the history of global civilizations. It's not like you find this happening spontaneously in other civilizations and so on. It, this is, seems to be quite rare, actually. And it's, obviously it has happened in much yeah, later anyway. in Europe, in Western Europe, in, in uh, but in the Islamic world earlier on, that it's really rare that they should ask these questions. And they're not just copying the ancient Greeks, as you say. The, yeah. uh, the, the Many of these questions are new questions formulated in a different way in the uh, in the Arab world, and uh, it it is remarkable. I think you you are exactly right. It sounds uh, like uh, pre-Socratic philosophers. Hmm. I encountered these rituals only pre-Socratic philosophers. No other civilization like uh, eighth and ninth century of Islamic civilization. So it's very, Many, rare, very rare indeed. In the they're history fighting of the world. against each other. Yeah. In terms yeah. of natural philosophy. Yeah. So it's not inevitable. What I'm trying to say is, it's not inevitable that this should have happened. It's not something that happened uh, in many other places. It was very rare. It was almost unique. There's perhaps only you mentioned the pre-Socratic philosophers, which we know a little bit about, but there was a great diversity and creative foment of ideas. Some of them are what we would call scientific, but it's so rare that we can only say it happened in the eighth ninth centuries in the Muslim world and in the pre-Socratics many centuries after that and then many centuries later uh, we see it happening as well in Europe so th these are rare moments in, in global history that these kinds of questions were asked with such uh, passion and such uh, uh, analytical skill uh, and uh, that benefited all of the, the they had universal benefits for mankind in the future. Yeah. yeah, thank you, thank you, yeah. Number 12. Th thank you, by the way, Paul, for your contribution. Yeah, it's worth saying, yeah. Oh, it's very kind of you. Well, thank you. This is the 12. So, and uh, uh, as I told you, it's very rare because Mutekellemun were asking about the universe we're asking about the nature of bodies. We're asking about how motion occurs and how change occurs. Importantly, they were developing different ideas, and uh, they don't only they didn't only criticize other thought system uh, like we saw. They were criticizing Aristotle. But it is rare in Middle Ages as well. Everyone was following what Aristotle says, as you know, in terms of motion. This is true. So, is but, true. Mm. so here, uh, when we uh, take a look closely, uh, we see that Mutekellumus uh, usually focus on two controversial areas. The first one, the key components of the universe. And the another one, how does universe function? So, of course, the second one includes motion, causality. The first one includes atoms, substance, accidents, properties of things, etc. So, and and uh, we in the ninth century, early ninth century, Mutekelum uh, gathered around three different opinions on the structure of bodies. The first group 
led by Drar bin Amr and Hussein and Naji, Nejjar and Hafsal Thar, they uh, developed a bundle theory. For instance, Richard Sorabji, he was a very famous, he's very famous uh, British uh, science, historian of science, as you know, Richard Sorabji. Also, uh, uh, in his book, he he is uh, uh, assuming Drab and Amr's and Hussein Najjar's view is very interesting in terms of uh, bundle theory. And they said that bodies uh, are made of just accidents, just properties. They refuse the existence of substance like John Locke and David Hume, as no. you know, in modern yeah. period. Yeah. For instance, John uh, Luke and uh, uh, Locke and uh, David Hume criticized the substance idea. Why we didn't see a substance as well? Mm -hmm. We didn't characterize mm -hmm. anything substance. Yeah. Same criticism directed by Drabinam. How can we say that substance exists? Why? Because we are not able to see that. That's why bodies must uh, be made of just mere uh, 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 accidents mm. or uh, attributes. It's more of an, empirical, more of an empirical method, isn't it? More of an empirical method of... Yeah, of, exactly. Uh, ...than the, the, uh, the, pri the, pri the previous method, yeah. Yeah, yeah they are uh, conscious about what they are saying. For instance, they said that Ulimel alemu bil basari labit delail it means that the universe uh, is known by observation, ah. not by just reason, right. rational right. Uh, ideas. Now, That's why they do uh, so just to, uh, theory. The, the, This is such an important point you've just made. Uh, uh, Dr. Stephen Mayer, who I had the great privilege yeah. of interviewing, uh, a week or two on blogging theology. He's uh, a very much a living American uh, advocate of intelligent design in the United States. And in his um, book, um, don't mean to keep on advertising it, but anyway, that, that's the book, uh, Return of the God Hypothesis. The very first chapter, he says that it was Christianity that came up with this idea that uh, uh, you need to go out and look and look at the universe and not just rely on pure pure reason and he he uh, effectively ignores um any uh precedents in the islamic world which came to that conclusion long before christians did in europe uh, and and here here is uh, the evidence the empirical method uh was found in the arab world first and indeed came to fruition there long before it did in the West. So uh, unfortunately, whatever the merits of Stephen Mayer's book may contain, um, on this particular point, he may he may want to look again at his his uh, his thesis. Yeah, thank you for your contribution. The another uh, uh, point of view regarding nature of substance was defended by Hisham bin Hakem and Esam. Uh, interestingly, they uh, refused to concept of accident and they maintain that everything is made of in the universe everything is made of just bodies so they refuse the concept of substance the concept of uh, accident as well yeah so this is also an interesting idea okay so but majority of muteke lumun including abul huzeyl al allah muammer bishir ibn mutamir and Bada Sukul and Bastian Sukul, after this idea uh, was also defended by Esharite and Matridis, they maintain that the universe is comprised of bodies, which are made of atoms, and accidents, which inherit that atoms. So this is the standard model of Kalam atomism, by the way, at that time. So, but interesting thing is that it, it was not easy for atomism to gain the battle between ideas at the first uh, center of, or also at the eighth, mid, uh, eighth center of uh, Islamic civilization. Yeah. There were fight uh, 
uh, between among different ideas regarding nature of bodies. But uh, finally, the third view, which says that the universe uh, are made of bodies, indivisible substances, and accidents, uh, became a dominant view of matter in Islamic civilization, especially in Kalam. Mm. So, but this view uh, also uh, was adopted by uh, many uh, uh, thought system in Islamic civilization. For instance, Imam Ashari, also his followers, Imam Ghazali, for instance, Imam Ghazali was using this uh, matter theory against Islamic philosophers, which defends helomorphism, uh, Aristotelian views. They were using these views. Also, this uh, uh, model uh, was used to prove the uh, temporality of the world, which is Hudu's okay. argument, the Kalam cosmological argument. Yeah. So they were using also their uh, physical theories to prove the existence of God, on the other hand. This aspect refers to components, key components of the universe. The another, there is another uh, uh, this, uh, district uh, territory, uh, which refers to how the universe functions. Uh, also, which includes motion and uh, causality. For instance, whether or not objects have nature. Also, secondary causation, tabulate how the continuity of object is ensured. Motion and rest, generation and corruption. These issues were being discussed by Mutekellemun at that time. So, and uh, we also see that Mutekellemun's view come uh, views come with very great diversity. We usually regard that Mutekellemun refused natural causality, but when we take a look, what they were uh, uh, arguing regarding the uh, functioning of the universe, we encounter that they adopted different views. Right. For instance, Badat Muta's like. Uh, uh, were defending nature's natural causalities. For instance, we usually regard that when fire and cutter, cotton comes, oh, yes. usually burning occurs. And if God asks, wills, he can prevent. But on the other hand, when we take a look, Badat Muta's light, uh, then uh, cotton and fire. It comes together. Even God cannot prevent burning. Why? Because they are defending natural causalities among Mutekellemun. But when we take a look, Basri and Mutazla school, they were defending different ideas to explain systematic uh, occurrence in the universe. They developed Iktiran theory, they develop Tawit theory, Itimat theory, which refers to uh, natural causes uh, in their system, for instance. Conjunction refers to Iktiran, appearance refers to Zuhur, also uh, impetus or force refers to Itimat, and it means that they develop sophisticated theories like today's science. Mm -hmm. Today, we are also developing some uh, theories, right? Yeah. They were uh, used to <laughs> developing to uh, explain uh, different aspects yeah, okay. of the universe. So I've noticed in, in modern cosmology and modern physics, you get a, uh, particularly in kind of cosmology and, and the, the big, big, uh, you know, the, you, at the, the level of the universe, you get a lot of speculative theories. You get a lot of ideas, a lot of speculation, 
um, and some of it quite fanciful. And I get the impression you get the same kind of creative specula speculation going here on a much yeah. earlier time. So, you know, it's not all going to be correct, subsequently proven, but it shows the fertility of the thinking there, uh, uh, this uh, creative scientific mind at work many, many centuries uh, before the West uh, uh, also got going on a similar uh, road, I think. Yeah, we also uh, should say that they were all theologians. Mm. They were all considering Islamic creeds. Yes. They were all considering uh, Tawhid principle, monotheism. But mm. Islamic creeds didn't prevent them to develop different ideas, different cosmological models, yeah. different uh, explanations in terms of how motion occurs. This yeah. is important. Yeah. That's why we should go further and should say that they were not just apologetics. They were just not theologians. They were interested in scientific and philosophical issues regarding cosmology, mm. regarding mm. physics, like uh, scientists or natural philosophers. There was no difference between uh, Islamic philosophers, Farabi and Ibn Sina, uh, in terms of dealing with these issues. Mm. You just say that they were just theologians and forget about their theories. Why? Because they were uh, writing books to explain special topics concerning physical issues. And they were discussing with each other, not only just Islamic philosophers, they were criticizing Aristotle and other philosophers by introducing new ideas and this is important yeah yeah number 13 so we are closing the end i just want to mention ibn matteweit then i'm going to give his ideas regarding motion oh so then we are going to finish inshallah well, I'm going to watch this video uh, at the end. Uh, it's an astonishing uh, video, which I promise you were not. Uh, I was generally uh, gobsmacked when I saw it, as were the people who witnessed this scientific experiment done, which was uh, originally conceived and proven by uh, Islamic scientists many centuries before Galileo uh, came up with the idea as well, much later. Anyway. Okay. The last example uh, I want to give, uh, I want to share Ibn Mettevey's uh, book, which is very, very famous at Teskre, Fi Ahkamil Jawahir Vel Araz. In his book, uh, his book is named also at Teskre Fi Latifil Kalam as well, which is related to our current uh, topic right now. And uh, this book is very valuable because it completely refers to what Mutekellumun uh, uh, thought regarding atoms and regarding accidences. And it comes with uh, uh, 800 pages, which is very, very, uh, okay. very long. <laughs> uh, book. So, and uh, so when we take a look, for instance, I am just uh, giving some uh, headings. Uh, headings, uh, for instance, in his the, in his the section of substance chapter, for instance, he was discussing about bodies do not consist of combination of accident, accident substance are perceived through seeing and touching. Being substance is only state of for substance. Substance has the state of being a direction. There is no increase in the quality of being existent to. Substance is a substance when non-existent, just as when exists. Substance does not occupy space when non-existent. Also, uh, uh, views on uh, space, time, and etc. And uh, it gives a lot of detailed information, which shows that Mutekellumun uh, developed uh, sophisticated concepts and theories just to explain just one term, which is substance, indivisible part. Hundreds of pages, pages, topics, topics, 
Amazing. The book was uh, giving a tremendous information. So, uh, in my view, if you are uh, dealing with history of civilization in Islam, we should give a important place for these mutakellumun. Because this is science, this is a philosophy, this is another, not another thing. That's why these are very valuable. Yeah. So, and I am going to show how valuable it is just by giving an example. How does teacher of Ibn Mattawi, how did Ibn Mattawi's teachers, like uh, for instance, uh, they lived in early 10th century, are explaining the problem of falling bodies. Right. This, is, folks, bodies. this is the great crescendo, folks, of the presentation. So uh, this is uh, not only intellectually fascinating, but actually really entertaining as well. Sorry. Over to you. <laughs> okay. Let's see. Okay. Yeah. Could you give me just a second? I uh, want to correct it. Interestingly, uh, just a second, uh, Paul. Of course. And those, those are just uh, explained that those two uh, photographs on the right there of the feather and the what looks like a ball or, or some kind uh, are actually um, shots from the BBC video, which we're going to show shortly. Uh, it was made just very recently um, showing an experiment that was done in, in the United States, um, uh, demonstrating the, uh, the case of the motion in terms of falling bodies, um, which um, Dr. Mehmet would, uh, will explain um, in a second. Um, so th these are screenshots from the video, and it is quite extraordinary. Um, if I, I wouldn't have believed this to be true had, you, had I not seen it on this video. Um, and you might be able to guess what it is, but uh, it's these falling objects, uh, the uh, the ball and the feather. That's the thing on the white thing on it is actually a feather, uh, like the sort of thing a bird would have. And the thing on the left, the round reddish object is, could be an apple, it's some kind of solid object. And, uh, and this is a famous experiment um, conducted um, in the Arab world many, many centuries ago. Um, but I don't want to um, anticipate Dr. Mahmoud too much here, uh, his so, presentation. Yeah. So I, I just want to give a concrete example how Mutekellumun yep. were seriously discussing uh, about motion, right. for instance. Uh, as I told you, Imam Eshari's Makalatul Islamiyin uh, comprises uh, ten something different topics regarding motion. Also, other Makalat books also uh, gave uh, a lot of information uh, how Mutekellumun discussed regarding motion as well. Also, I already gave Ibn, Ibn Nadim's uh, Fihrist, uh, he was giving book names uh, that uh, uh, Mutekellumun wrote just to explain how motion takes place uh, in the universe. So here, uh, in his Tazkirafi Ahkam al-Jawahir wal araz and uh, Jawahir refers to atoms and accidences, and uh, Ibn Mattawai's books. And Ibn Mattawai discusses differences in the descent of light and heavy bodies in, in the atmosphere, and he says that air in the atmosphere is the reason for the difference between the descent of light and heavy bodies. Mm. Otherwise, here is very important, is a stone and feather were simultaneously dispatched they would descend together. However, air 
is an obstacle money to the descent of light body while a hill body pierces through it. This is the sound doctrine regarding the cause for this phenomenon, according to our teachers who lived in the uh, 10th century, early 10th century. So you're saying so that if you, if, they you got a, mercy from them. if you were to drop a feather and a solid object like a uh, an apple or a cannonball at the same time, if it wasn't for the re- exactly. if it wasn't for the resistance in the air this itself, is- um, they would actually fall at the same time, at the same rate, at the same speed from the the top to the moment of impact when they hit the ground. Now, of course, how can this be true? And uh, <laughs> well, at that time, Mutekelemu's ideas was regarded crazy. For yep. instance, if we take a look at Ibn Sina, he was discussing uh, against Mutekelemu. How is it that? For instance, even Aristotle said that bodies fall according to their uh, heaviness. Yeah. Uh, and, this, and this is the common sense idea. That that is going to sense. fall more fast than. Oh, of course. But the point, is, the point is, actually, this Arab uh, from uh, the 10th, 11th century was actually right. And we know this for a fact today. And the BBC a filmed the experiment. Uh, yeah. We're going to see that in a minute. But this uh, idea was uh, defended by Mutekellumun at 10th century. Mm. But usually modern scholarship regard that the first person who came up with this idea was Galileo. Right. Was Galileo. When you take oh, so he, he was, of course, he was a, a, a Roman yeah, Catholic but, uh, and uh, a Christian Roman Catholic in Italy many, many centuries later. And he, is, he gets the credit for coming up with this idea, uh, even though it was uh, propounded many, many centuries earlier by the Muslims. Yeah. He is saying here, uh, for instance, in his... Uh, to new sciences, he is saying that if uh, there was no air, different uh, bodies and with a different uh, weight uh, were supposed to fall at the same time. And he became famous, as you know, at that time. Exactly. Well. So we need a we need a vacuum. Basically, we need a chamber or a room where the air is removed because the air itself is the issue here. That's why we have these differing uh, results. That's why the feather doesn't fall as quickly as uh, the solid object. But if we remove the air and we can do this in a vacuum today, what do we find? That's the question. Let's take a look. <laughs> Oh, let's have a look then, because we can see what happens. Were the Muslims right? And was Galileo, many centuries later, uh, echoing their ideas? Was he right as well? And we can actually witness an experiment done just a few years ago, thanks to the BBC in the United States. Here we go, folks. This is an amazing experiment. I was gobsmacked when I first saw this, but you can see the proof in front of your very eyes. <laughs> so he concluded they were Paul, let's, let's read uh, Ibn Mettevi's account again. I think he describes the situation better than Galileo. Because he is giving concrete examples, stone and feather. Again. Here. So. Here we go. And those are the photographs from the BBC film there on the right. So, uh, do you see the screen? 
Yep, yep. Let's certainly see it. Uh, uh, let's let's take a look uh, Ibn Mettevi's account again. It, we'll need to go to the next one then, to the fifth. Is it fifteen? If you want to read his account of uh, what happens. Do you see the screen right now, fifteen? No, you need to click on it. There we go. Fourteen, I think. Oh, okay. Unless you want to read yeah. the account, in which case you need to go to fifteen. If you want to read his account. Okay. You need to go to the next one. Here is giving uh, Ibn Mettevi's account. Okay, if you click on number 15, because you're oh, on... This is Galileo. I want to read Ibn Mettevi. Okay. Here. Do you see the Ibn Mettevi's account? No, you need to click on it. Oh, hang on. It, it's... Well, which one okay. is it on? Which? Okay, is it on 14, is it? 14. I beg your pardon. In that case, we're on the right screen. Beg your pardon. Yeah, okay. that's good. That's yeah. good. Let, let's take a look Ibn Mettevi's account of falling bodies again. I think he's uh, more successfully explaining uh, the falling bodies uh, because he's uh, uh, completely giving the example of uh, feather and uh, stone example. Mm. And he says that air in the atmosphere is the reason for the difference between the descent of light and heavy bodies. Otherwise, if a stone and a feather were dispatched, they would descend together. This is what completely today's experiment just showed us. Because of the vacuum, they took the air out of exactly. it, which is no longer an obstacle. And so you have... What we saw, what we saw, so that's remarkable, and and this is many centuries before Galileo, who is credited oh, yeah, yeah. with this insight, wrongly credited with this unique insight. In fact, like so many things that we uh, credit ourselves with in the West, whether it be the circulation of the blood, I've noticed, and or other things, all credited to Euro Western European uh, yeah, scientists. Yeah. In fact, were uh, discovered many centuries earlier by uh, Muslim yeah. uh, thinkers. But the important thing is that it was just mere coincidence. Hmm. Mutekelemun uh, had already been discussing about how motion occurs. They wrote hundreds of books. They developed many ideas. We can take a look even Nadim's Fihris. We can take a look Makalat books. So that's why at the end they developed such a view, which is even valuable our today's science. Mm -hmm. That's why mm -hmm. we should consider Mutekelemu's interest with natural, uh, theo natural science and philosophy. Yeah. And uh, in our today's uh, re research regarding history of civilization, this is what I am trying to say uh, at my article. Yeah. So... In conclusion, uh, when we take uh, Makalat books into consideration, also when we consider Ibn Nadim's Fihrist and other uh, explanations of books of Mutekellumun, uh, we should say that Mutekellumun showed great interest towards Takik and Latif topics, namely which uh, refer to uh, science and philosophy regarding cosmology, epistemology, ontology, like this. So we can also see that Mütekellemun's interest uh, uh, is not just uh, for being apologetics, not just by being defending Islamic creeds, they were dealing with these issues for the sake of uh, truth uh, seekers uh, as a scientist in their times, as, a, uh, uh, as we already see that Mutekellumun uh, were regarded as a kind of philosophers, mm. Uh, mm. like uh, Jahus and Nazam mentioned. So all these information illustrates uh, that earlier Mutekellumun uh, 
approach Dakikul Kalam not only with aim of using it as a defense, uh, but also to study it, it just for the sake of truth. Yeah. And yeah. they contributed uh, human civilization in terms of science and philosophy. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Paul, for giving wow. this opportunity. Well, thank you very much for uh, an absolutely fascinating uh, presentation, a very important one. And just to uh, uh, mention that uh, Dr. Mehmed's website, he has, he has one. Um, uh, you can see uh, his books, articles, videos at uh, mehmetbulgan.com. Uh, I'll link to it uh, in the description below so you can follow up further um, uh, issues for discussion as well there so it's absolutely fascinating for, for many reasons i thank you very much indeed sir for your uh, time your expertise your knowledge which uh, i'm sure will be of huge interest and benefit to to many people including myself thank you uh, thank you paul as well giving this opportunity uh, see you inshallah until next time welcome